Okay, welcome everybody. We, we are about to start. First of all, I want to, thanks our, to thank our dear friend Gary Rockwell and Louis Jukins for accepting this invitation. And uh, well, neither Gary nor Louis need any presentation. You all know them very well. Gary has judged at the highest Olympic levels. Louis is a wonderful FEI judge from the US. She has judged all the important competitions throughout the Americas. So I will not waste my time in talking about them. And what we're going to do, as I mentioned in the post that I sent in Facebook, we're gonna talk about corrections. This is gonna be a very informal conversation between Gary and Louis. Uh, I will jump in from time to time. And if you have questions, you have a chat at the bottom in the middle of your screen. So you can send questions and then I will ask the questions to the presenters. But in order to keep the good quality of the sound, I'm asking all of you to remain with your uh, audio closed so that we don't have any interference for our wonderful speakers today. So with that, we will start and I will give the floor then to Gary and Louis to start. You, you decide how to start. This is very informal. Gary starts. Well, I think Lois will start. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I think we have some judges on the call, but I think, Lois, if you want to just describe a little bit on how we come up with a score for a movement. Yes. Um, we have... Uh-oh. Oh, there you go. Can you see we it? Have, yeah. We have, um, in our judges' training, we stress this equation. And... and First, we should thank USDF for sharing it with us. It's their copyrighted material that we gave them. But um, and first, we start out with the basics, and that's all training, all movement, all acceptance of the bit. It's everything. It's the most important part of starting our formulating a score. Then we go to the criteria, which is the movements and what they look like and how they're described in our rule book. Uh, and then we decide, does it resemble what's described for example, a shoulder and has to be so many degrees with band and carriage. And it's important that we know the criteria of each movement in each level. And Gary's gonna go through the levels. Uh, training level, for example, only has circles and transitions, and straight lines. It doesn't really have any big movements. So we really, it, at training level, focus more on the basics and maybe the size of the circles and things like that. The modifier in here, the plus or minus, if you see that, the plus or minus, uh, the modifier are small things that can happen and if it's brief and not serious and not impinging on the basics or the criteria, then we raise, lower, or keep the same, our basics plus criteria scores. And that's how we come up with the final score. So sad to say, for example, it's, doesn't seem fair, but the best moving, best trained, best ridden horse starts at a higher basics value. If they can do the movements, 
then they fulfill the criteria. So we're starting high. And then if they have a little trip, a little blow up, that can lower a score. A major or a minor mistake it is not handled as harshly as a major mistake. Again, back to the basics. We're always going to go to the basics. So it's important that you do your training correctly. And could we show the pyramid? Yes, of course. You're the greatest. Hold on a second. Do you have anything to add to the methodology of judging, Gary? We can talk a little bit about what is the essence of each movement. So we'll, we'll, oh. we'll talk a little bit about uh, at each level where, where the points are. Right. But I can just say that uh, I have seen um, mistakes in every movement at every level that I've judged over the years. And I thought it would be interesting to make a topic out of how to correct things when they go wrong to recover as many points as possible. Horses make the same mistakes at the horse show that they make at home. And they can only be confident in making a, in a, in a correction unless that it's quietly corrected at home without tension. I was uh, lucky to be in London early this year and visit Carl Hester. And one of the things he mentioned to a group was that we, don't, we never tell a horse he was wrong. We only just make the proper correction. So the most important thing the, of the whole evening will just to be to say that corrections make the horse correct and they don't punish a horse. And because horses are not quite as smart as our dogs, in my opinion, um, you have to make a correction with, or, you know, with a horse within a few, few seconds, within a few strides, in order for it to relate it all to what's gone wrong and, and, and um, in that way train the horse. Uh, tension multiplies problems. Uh, sometimes in the arena we see what might have been a four turn into a one because uh, the, a good correction was not made. Uh, Lois, do you want to talk a little bit about, suppose we start with intro or training level and the horse comes down the center line. So what is the essence of that movement? The halt. And the, the modifiers would be? The modifiers, we still can't let go of the rhythm of the trot or whatever intro and training it's either walk or trot but um a modifier might be it's a little early it's a little late it's a little off center line right the transitions would be modifiers transitions are important but they're modifiers they're important modifiers. So, so the essence of the movement is the halt. And if, and we see this, horses start down the center line uh, two or three meters to the right of the center line. Should they correct it or should they stay there? Sometimes they stay there. In my opinion, if, if I were the trainer, I'm not quite sure, but if I were, Actually, if I were the trainer, I'd think, well, how does a horse know center line from any line? Right. You know, they were straight, they were off the line. But as a judge, we can't excuse not being on center line because that's part of the criteria. Right. So that if the basic, if the, if the essence of the movement is the halt and the horse comes down the center line off the center line, it would be smart to get back on the center line and make the halt on the center line because that's the It'll point easy, right there. Yes. So even if, if, if you came crooked down the center line, but you got yourself to X and your halt was an X and your move off, uh, your halt was a eight, your move off was an eight and the trot following was an eight, you could still get fairly close to an eight yeah. for the whole movement. But if you, if you stay off the center line for the whole movement, 
Now your halt is not even where it's supposed to be, which by the way is the most important thing. I mean, you have to be where you're supposed to be in the arena or there is no correct position or straightness. It's just crooked. So I think that that would be a good recovery for the center line halts. And then there's not really much of any movements in intro and first level so that you're constantly correcting little things of the geometry and the tempo and the strides, right? Yeah, and the main thing at both of those levels is that the horse is starting its training well. You know, they don't have to be strong, but they have to be, and we see it as judges. We see how the training, how the development is going. And that's pretty important for us that, okay, so it's a little, let's say it's a little off center line. If the circle's a little big or a little small, that affects the movement, but not as badly as if it's ridden above the bed or uh, or over flexed or or in the pull together so much that the rhythm is affected. Right. So we're basically at intro and first level. We're we're judging the gates. Um, I went to a very interesting um, lecture by Hillary Clayton this year, where she discussed the, within the nerves, there are components that regulate how one leg coordinates with another leg. This is determined in the genes. So a horse is not aware of walking or trotting or cantering. It's in the horse's genes that determine when the horse breaks from the walk to the trot or the trot to the canter or the canter to the trot it has to do in the end with energy levels, but also it's predetermined in the genes at what point a horse changes its gait. Therefore, when I see people punish a horse for breaking from the trot or uh, to the canter or the canter to the trot, I think how completely illogical that is because the horse has no awareness of this. Most of them have not read the rule book, I assume. So there's no awareness of a horse that it's making a mistake and sometimes they are accused of making mistakes there. So that's one of the, what's one of the corrections that I see in the arena that bothers me the most. Um, if a horse breaks from the trot to the canter, you should take a few steps to get it back to the trot and proceed, and that's the correction you want to have, and it should be without tension. And the same thing from the canter to the trot. There's a certain mile per hour where it becomes, takes more energy to canter slow than it does to trot. So they, they break, and, and within a few strides of balancing the horse, you should return uh, to the canter then. So I thought that was very interesting. I um, hadn't been aware that this and and a bad walk by the way is an anomaly of those nerves not that a bad walk can't be improved by the rider's aids or good walk can't be destroyed by the rider's aids but the the walk of the a bad walk is in the genes the gated horses that's an anomaly of the genes the pacers are an anomaly of the genes it's all already born in the horse the coordination of one leg to another. And the other thing she said, and we'll talk about it more later, is the flying change. Right. Is for them, they only do them in, in wild because their balance allows Actually, them. one thing she said was that it's an unnatural thing for the horse, except when they're very young. You, right. you will see foals make flying changes, but they come of a, to a maturity and flying changes are not natural for a horse. And you can imagine uh, uh, what the horse thinks you're doing when it's ca cantering along in a very comfortable canter it was born with, when suddenly the rider throws itself all around the place trying to get a flying change and that it must be very confusing. And for some horses, it's a big problem in the training. It, it's a time when horses stall out for a while. Yeah. Should we go to first level or should I yes. talk to the pyramid a little? Talk to the pyramid a little bit. 
Okay, part of how we get to our basic score, if you remember the equation, the pyramid of training or the, or the training scale, if that's what you call it, um, is set up in, in, it's somewhat logical on paper, but in training, some horses are born with this to do it easily. Some horses are challenged and some horses are impeded by the rider. So they, you know, they are crooked or stiff or the contact is wrong. So the base of the pyramid is rhythm. And that's the important part of, I, I'd say the bottom three are very important in this training intro first level and and then and then as the levels go up and the strength goes up they can develop impulsion i mean they all they're born with a certain amount of impulsion but to get the higher things on the list the collection for example that takes training and that takes strengthening and it, it correct training straightness is a tough one for the horses you must be straight in order to be impulsive that's why it's a little kind of confusing um, on the pyramid but i guess they had to place it somewhere uh, and but it's obviously there from the beginning. You, when you get on a horse the first time, right. you take a step forward, you're trying to guide it right. in a straight line. But I think the expectation as you go up the levels is more uh, for the straightness and the collection of e with each level, the expectation the, of the impulsion is, is more. Also, when you just get on the horse for the first time, you really work on straightness right off the bat to get them to go forward or, or to go in some direction that's not just willy-nilly. So we work on all of these things. Gary wants to call it a Rolodex, but uh, younger people wouldn't understand that. Well, I think all the components of the training scale are there from the beginning. And you might even see a young horse get a little excited and offer a little passage. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that even though that's not in the training at that point, I mean, sometimes horses do offer a certain degree of it. Um, I think as you move on to first level, there's still not very many movements. The, the circles become smaller. Um, I want to make a comment about all sideways movements and their corrections because here, here we just start with leg yielding. It's prescribed to be from letter to letter and for the horse to balance well, every step should be the same amount forward and sideways. If you go too much sideways in the beginning, then you have to go straight to correct to go to finish the leg yielding. If you go too long straight and then you have to go sideways, that's more that's harder for the horse. If in the event that a horse would canter in the middle of any sideways movements, it's very difficult to correct it at the same time you're uh, moving sideways. It's almost always necessary to go straight to, uh, to recover the, the trot if the horse canters. Um, same thing later, we'll talk about half passes. You know, when a horse is making a half pass, in the say in the canter and it breaks to the trot. It's very hard to make a correction um, while you're moving sideways. It's almost better always to go straight a couple steps to get the gait back and then to go sideways again. You've already messed up the movement. I mean, when you broke, you lost the majority of the points. You probably have a four. Not that there's a formula here, but it sounds like insufficient to have lost the, the gait. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you do for correction? I've even seen at Grand Prix, a horse in the trot half pass break to the canter and canter the entire diagonal trying to get the trot back again. So the, the, the four became a one. 
uh, it would have been better probably to go on the diagonal toward the letter, get the canter and then uh, uh, get the trot back and then continue then to make a disaster of the whole thing and get almost a zero. In a correction, if it's possible, it's a good thing to do a correction nicely and effectively than to not do it. You're going to get a low score, but I think in training your horses, it's important to not let it go on too long. I agree. Um, in the, as we start into the second level movements, we have a shoulder in. Very often when I'm judging, I see a horse come out of a corner and the rider's too strong with the inside rein and the horse comes off the track. And that's again like the uh, center line. I mean, some riders just stay in there and ride the whole movement in there. And the correction should be they take a step to the inside, the rider takes a step to the outside like a leg yield with the haunches leading to get the hind legs into the track again and be able to recover some of the movement. Generally, the bend from the corner is enough for a shoulder in. So really it's unnecessary to be strong or to use much inside rein at all or, or to bend more for the shoulder in. But that's a com pretty common error that I see, Lois. How about you? I, I do. And and the thing is, mechanically, if you're strong on the inside rein, too strong, especially in a shoulder end, which is a collecting exercise, it often will cause the hunches to swing out, which you don't want, and affects the collection and the ability to carry. So it is important to correct it. And judging when it, if, the rider can correct it, we appreciate it more than, than just riding the shoulder in wrong. Again, the criteria. Okay. I think you could, I'm sorry. Gary, excuse me. We, we, we have a question from okay. one of the people attending. She huh? says, I, I want to ask about young stallions who tend to get hot or distracted and start whining while doing a figure, how would you score that? We have to uh, accept it as tension, uh, like any other, uh, inattentiveness uh, and tension, Lois. It's how it affects the movement. A lot of horses can scream and still do it fairly well. Other horses are totally thinking about something else. Right. then it's not going to score well. It's one of those things, my favorite expression from Gary is, horses do that. Well, not all horses do that, but, you know, it kind of makes me giggle a little bit when they get distracted, but it makes me smile a lot when they can get their attention back. Right, right. How about uh, Lois turns on the haunches? How, how would you like to see a rider finish that uh, turn on the haunches? Because I see quite a variety of corrections. Well, a turn on the haunches can be how many meters? Is it a meter big behind? I don't think we have a size limit. Yeah, we do. But um, me. I think it's a meter. And so if you do a meter, a turn on the haunches, that's one meter or less, you're going to be off the rail or off your pattern. I see a lot of riders um, half passing back to the line or just steering back to the line. And I would rather, if, if it's on the rail, which they're not anymore. Aren't they all on the, between M and H? So we as judges can't really see if you're on your line or not. So go straight right. ahead, but aim at the letter you're supposed right. to. One of the reasons why okay. we changed, the, took all the turns on the haunches off the rail was it was so awkward to see people try to get back. Right. 
and uh, no one can Please. see where the tunnel oh, is. Yeah. Even, even a wall pirouette is going to end up one horse width over from where it started if it, if it pivots on the inside hind leg. Right. So it's going to come out on a slightly different line. It's much better to stay there than to go sideways back to your original line. No one can see where you are. We might see it, but we don't penalize it because no. mechanically, how else can you do it? And I think in second level, as we, we begin um, collection, the, the emphasis becomes more and more on transitions. Um, transitions determine how good a start you get off to where you're going. You know, if you have a very clean walk to canter from your aids, you're off to probably a good balance in the, in the canter. If you ask for the canter and the, trot, the, the horse runs forward in the walk or trots a few steps into the canter, it's probably not going to be a uh, collected canter. It's probably not going to be very well balanced. And it's also, this is a really important, this, this walk to canter, I th think is not the best ridden transition when I judge or when I give clinics. And it's a prerequisite <laughs> to teach line changes, that it be immediately from your aid without any fluff or unclear steps or tension. Uh, it's a very important thing. So Lois, what do you like to see in a, in a simple change? What, it, what is the essence of the movement? Oh. oh, what I'd love to see is a horse that has a good canter, that's supple with good contact, has impulsion and some straightness. And I want to see the canter be as balanced as possible. Then they're setting themselves up for a good down transition. I also want to see as a judge, the walk, those few steps of walk between the canter the walk and the canner again, to be allowed to connect. And I'd like the uphill uh, canner to part to be just really up and really easy. Not just, what was the word people used in other sports, a cue. It's not a cue, it's, it's got to be they have the balance so that they can answer the rider's aids. And what I don't like to see is pulling back to the trot. Then usually you get the few, I mean, pulling back to the walk, usually you get a little bit of trot in there then. Because by pulling, you bring the horse onto the forehand and they can't carry down. Transitions should be light and soft. So the basis, the, the essence of the movement is the two transitions. Um, yeah. And then modifiers would be the quality of the canter, the quality of the walk. But the two transitions are the base score and we average them. And what if is, you, oh, sorry. Here, so now, for example, a horse makes a very good transition from canter to walk, then takes the wrong lead and the, the right correction should be walk again a few steps and correct it uh, to the canter. I have seen many times horse take the wrong lead and the rider makes a flying change back to the right lead. Yeah. That is, a, that is a lower score. That is a lower score because you have not fulfilled the criteria of showing walk to canter. You never did fulfill that criteria. So what could be, say, the, the, the transition from canter to walk is an eight, then the horse takes the wrong lead and it's corrected. It could still to me be a six or a five at least. But if the horse makes a good transition from canter to walk and then takes the wrong lead and the horse makes the flying change, this is really an insufficient score then because one of the transitions was never shown. I agree. Um, another new movement at Second level is rain back. Lois, what is the criteria there? Where, where are the points in the rain back? 
Um, the criteria is there should be, it should be from halt, preferably a square halt, because if it's not square, it's easier actually, because if you kind of a sensitive rider, you know which leg is gonna go back so you know how to manage your aids. It's a more difficult movement and more correct to do it from a square halt because it's a test of their uh, what do you call that when they submit it's submissiveness it's a test of submissiveness they should go back in a two beat rhythm diagonal steps and a rule book incorrectly says they should halt, then go forward. Don't. Our, our rule book at the moment says they can do either. They can either go, they should go directly forward, but in our rule book, it's being changed. Right. It did say they, they could that. also have a halt, but we have never really wanted to see a halt there. But the essence of that movement is the rain back itself. Yes. And the halt is a, is a modifier and the transition forward is then a modifier. And then as we come to then third level, we have half passes and flying changes. And, and what's, what be, when the, the corrections become more difficult is when the movements are more involved and, and closer together. There's not very much time, you know, in between movements in, once you get to third and fourth level. <laughs> Um, if you are in counter canter and you have a flying change coming and you, 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 the horse switches leads or something, you have only a few steps, which is what a correction is, only a few steps to make the, to do it properly and in order to still be able to show the flying change. Um, again, half passes. It's very difficult if you're uh, trotting sideways and the horse canters, it's very difficult to get the trot back unless you make the horse straight in the transition. And then what about flying changes, um, Lois? Where, where, where are your criteria? Where are the points? What are the modifiers? The flying change is, it should be clear, clean. And if it's not, then it's, it's not a modifier, it's a basic problem if it's not clean. It's true. But some t it also depends on the test because sometimes the, the flying change is included with a half pass. Then, in my opinion, and I think yours too, um, sometimes the half pass and then the flying change are together score, which I kind of agree with. But um, I think at third level, not. But in fourth level and pre-St. George and above, they're included in the movement. But the half pass is the essence, or yes. So if the test is written so that the half pass and the flying change are, are scored together, then, then the flying change is a modifier. The reason for that yes. is because there's a lot of flying changes in the test. There's only one half pass in cancer. <laughs> In third level, I think the flying changes are separate. Yes, they, sometimes they're separate, but as you go up to the levels, then they, they're often included within the half pass and then the, um, they're treated as a modifier. Right. And then as the movements again become more and more difficult, it's more important to make a correction quickly in order to recover your, your, your test. I see a lot of people start the flying, the sequence changes, uh, say the flying changes every four strides. They make one four and then the horse makes a mistake and makes the three. And then they, they sort of try to keep their original count instead of making sure that they start counting all over again after the, the mistake. So, uh, you know, sometimes you, they, you, the horse makes a, Four, four strides, flying change, and then it makes a three, and then they, they end up making a five. 
because they're still trying to count the ori their original way, sometimes you have to stop and, and start all over again. But I wonder sometimes, Gary, the diagonal is only so long to start over again and you're halfway through. No, I don't mean start the changes over again. I'm talking about starting the count in your mind. Oh, yes. As soon as a correction could be made, the better the score is going to be. Right. Um, in any flying change, if it's a clean change, out of count, or not at the right spot, that's not as important as uh, a change that's not correct. Right. Very, I see many points lost in the fourth level in St. George where the horse has to counter canter, say through the corner in pre-St. George, and the horse makes a mistake and the flying change is coming up. And that's a lot of points. If they, if they think, oh, well, I've already changed, I'll just keep going. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of points lost. And then you lo lose the points for the counter canter and the, the points for the flying change. It's a big mistake. Yeah. Gary, excuse me, I, I have a question there. For yes. instance, in the St. George, uh, when we have to judge the period, the, I've, seen, I've heard some discussions right after the period, but before the corner, the horse makes a flying change, but it's not after the corner, but before. Would you include that in the the score for the half period, or would you include it in the score for the country country flying change, depending on as to where did it do it? If it's before the letter, then it belongs to the pirouette. And then and then if it's if you have to read the test, if if the pirouette lasts until the end of the diagonal at the letter at uh, what is it H H H. Yeah, so if it happens before age, it belongs to the pirouette. But it's a modifier. You know, it's not, it's not equal in, in importance to the pirouette. The pirouette is most important. Right. Good. Right. That's a great answer. That's what I thought. But I had some arguments. I will not say with whom about that, but thank you. <laughs> the pirouette is much harder. So, you know, then if, you, if you allow me, Louis, I, I have a question before we go on to those levels. From yeah. from Shannon Duick, it's asking, what is the ultimate purpose of a walk period? I guess I'm asking what is the most important aspect of this movement at the lower levels to eventually arrive at collection? Uh, I think it's the beginning of uh, the collection, but really the, also the beginning of being able to move shoulders control the shoulders and control the haunches. And it is a, a demonstration of training. In my opinion, any horse can do a good turn on the haunches or walk pirouette. It's the riders that have to be a little more vigilant. Uh, it's an easy thing. And we chat about it in our judges' courses that that's a place where a non-brilliant horse can get a really high score because that's a training issue. It's not an issue of it's a wonderful horse or not a wonderful horse or a talented horse. It's a training issue. And, you know, like the halts, like the turn on the haunches, even the rain backs, I don't want to sound prejudiced, but you know, your granddaughter's little pony can get a 10 on any of those things. It's also an indicator of, of the uh, submission and the acceptance of the aids because we do see horses lose a clear rhythm sometimes in the turns on the haunches and in the uh, walk pirouettes usually related to either tension or lack of suppleness in the walk. Or incorrect aids. Correct aids, yes. And um, 
Walks are, I think riders are not careful enough with walks generally. I, where I, some of the places where I teach, I see that riders don't really commit to the, to schooling the walks very much. They're always wanting the horse to be ready to pee off or the horse to be ready to canter or something. And especially when we start to talk about the higher levels, um, generally you should ride the best walk you can ride and out of nowhere ask for the canter or out of nowhere ask for a pee off. You know, when you start to jazz a horse up or get it ready, get it ready, that's where a lot of problems come in with the impure rhythms in the walk. So that's, yes. Gary, I have a question. So how much weight, you know, how much weight would you give to the lowering of the hunches of the taking weight uh, within the period? Because within it, the, within the walk pirouette or the yeah. canter? Well, I, I don't, it's really, I, I think that's asking too much. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I, I don't expect much at all. No. If a horse can, it's going to get has a better chance. Uh, but but if, it's not really, I mean, it's almost sat asking for a problem to get into really lowering the haunches for this. I think you have a it doesn't, might very risk, it's not might a risk. I would use. Uh, yeah, it's not a criteria I would never, uh, I would never say the word sit in a walk pirouette, a comment. Can or pirouette, yes. Yes. Okay, and I have a question, uh, and it's concerning the flying changes. Um, it says, Dr. Dr. Klimke once said that it is a bit unfortunate that the judges look at the amount of flying changes rather than at the quality of the canter. He said that the mistaken, the mistaken number of flying changes line changes is inferior in case of a very good quality canter. What are your thoughts on this? Well, the quality of the canter should dictate the quality of the flying changes for sure. But um, the criteria of the movement is a certain number of flying changes. Um, we do, we observe the quality of the canter the entire way through the test. You know, we have a lot of time to appreciate the quality of the canter, but there comes a point where if the, if the test requires five changes every four strides, inability to show five changes every four strides in that particular moment is important. It could still be a sufficient score, but, and, and if, the, if the quality of the canter is a 10, then a mistake will not be result in the same score as if the quality of the canter is a six to start with. So we deduct from quality. So I think the answer to this for, do, for Dr. Klimke, what I think he's saying is that we should deduct from quality and that's what we do. Right, because good, great. we also know that a good horse with big changes is really, you know, essentially flying a little bit. And sometimes you can get a nearly lateral canter and they can do flying changes. It's pretty easy. But I would give that a lower score because of what Rhina Klunk has said. Uh, you know, a big, good canter, big, good changes is much more impressive than clean, flat changes. And we have to be a little bit on our toes because sometimes with a poor, a horse with a poor quality canter suddenly has a much better quality canter in the flying changes than he does when he's just simply in a straight well, line. That does something, doesn't it? Yeah, so it's, it's fairly complicated, I would say. So Lois, what else would you like to talk about? You wanna talk about massage Piaf or yeah, pirouettes think, or sure. anything in the Grand Prix. Um, yeah, I think we should talk about Passage and PF. Okay. And the criteria, I guess we know, that the haunches should lower. They, it should be in two beats. And in 
in Passage, it has impulsion. In PF, not as much. It has activity, but not impulsion. Do you agree with that? Of course, yes. So if a judge should not say in PF loses impulsion. That's that's kind of one of my thoughts. It makes me a little crazy. Right. And usually in some of our, well, and definitely in our Grand Prix test, but in most of our tests, we have separate scores for the transitions and the Piaf. And we usually average the two transitions uh, to come up with a transition score. If a horse, say, canters into a Piaf, um, that's nearly a zero for that particular transition. And then if he, and then if he comes out in a, in a seven or eight uh, transition to the passage, it's still usually an insufficient score because you're averaging an eight with a four, with a zero. You're averaging an eight with a zero and coming out with a four. So but, transitions are very expensive. But likewise, if they do a, a PF that travels too much, you know, a little tiny bit is healthy, but too much, then it's going to affect not only the PF score, but the transition scores. It right. can't not, because it's easier to have a forward PF and get out of it. It's an easier transition to make for the rider. It's harder if they actually do a pirouette sort of in place. And then sometimes the PF itself is disrupted. It starts very well and then it jumps forward a little bit and then it recovers the, the PF again. And that's a deduction, but it's not, um, it's not always an ins insufficient score. It depends again on the quality <coughs> of the overall performance. What if they rear? It's not good, is it? <laughs> Sometimes exciting. <laughs> what about the number of steps? It's very important to count the number of steps when we judge. In the uh, pirouette too. And this is where you sometimes get huge differences in the judges' scores because uh, sometimes judges don't count. And we really, really have to. We really have to. This can make a huge difference in the placings uh, because Piaf is such an expensive uh, movement, you know. So if one judge only counts eight strides and the other judge appreciated the Piaf but thought, and thought it was just fine and gave it an eight, you suddenly have a huge difference. Uh, in scores. Yes, Gary, I agree. But I, I might say, since we have here also trainers and writers, I think it's also important for them to count because then if they don't count, uh, and then our scores are not going to be as good as they expect because they're not fulfilling the criteria. I think, I think a lot of writers don't count, but also I'm, I'm not sure that they know exactly when to start counting. Tell us. That's good. You tell me. I, I mean, I, I know I, in my mind, I, I know exactly where I start my count is when the horse settles into the balance. But I think that the rider somehow is count. Sometimes they count the rhythm in the transition already. They're, they're in a rhythm and somehow they feel it. So they sort of maybe start counting early or they wait and don't think about it. I don't know. But it's better to hear on too many than too few. And it's surprising because sometimes horses with quite good piast, it seems there's, there should be no reason uh, to, to, to cut it so short or to make so many. It's better to make more than less. But um, I, I'm a sometimes a little surprised that the riders don't know exactly when to start counting. Do you have any other questions, Cesar? On that? Not so far. You can continue. Okay. So what else, Lois, what else should we talk about then? I'm trying to think. In, in let's say, in judging a walk pirouette or turn on the haunches,
if something goes wrong, I, I, I think it's very important to correct it as soon as possible. Uh, but in judging it, we're taught, see, in, in judging, we don't have, you got to give this score if that happens. In other words, if they make one flying change in a series, that's automatically this. It depends, as we spoke about earlier, on the quality of the changes. If there's one mistake in a short line, that's weighed harsher than if there's one mistake in a long line. Right. I think my screen is frozen. Are you guys still on? If we're on. Okay. You're fine. It's only okay. Louise that is frozen, but but we can hear her well, so we can continue. Okay. Do you, I, hear Louis? Hello. Us. It may be. It may be. It may be her internet connection, but we can continue. I'm sure she'll come back. Okay. Um, I want to go back one more time then to the Grand Prix half passes because this is, this is a place where I see things go wrong all the time. Uh, in the Grand Prix, there's, there, it, it's uh, from K to B and then back over to H. Very steep half passes. If a horse breaks in the middle of one of those half passes, then Hold on, she's calling me. Let me see what I can. Hello? Hello? Yes, I know. She's disconnected. Is your internet out? Is your internet out? Can't hear her. What did she say? I can't hear her. Lois? Why don't, shall I keep talking and, and you can try yes. to get back yes. a little? All right. So, so here, here again, the horse, if it's in the trot, um, in the Grand Prix, there's, there's, if you, if you, you can't make the half pass longer, otherwise you have no room to make the second half pass. So in a lower level, in a lower level half pass, uh, maybe the horse breaks, you could, you could get, have a little more time to make it straight and end it late and just say, okay, I made a mistake. It's going to be a low score anyway. In the Grand Prix, you can't end the, half, the first half pass late because you won't be able to make the second one. So it's very hard to get the trot back if the horse canters or the canter back if, if the horse trots, unless you actually turn onto the diagonal to, for a couple steps to get it and then, then recover the, at least the second half pass. But this I've seen many, many times, both half passes are lost. In the, in the effort to get the, first, the gate back in the first one, they go too far past the letter and then they have no room to make the second one. That's, that's a terribly expensive. I've seen some top rides completely crash with that. Okay, Gary, I, I have to, I have, I have two questions now. Yeah. Um, one is, is it more important to have an uphill frame with shoulders up in a stiffer, longer backed horse? Trying to achieve the Grand Prix movement or sacrifice a bit uphill for a more supple frame? I think the supple back will influence enough of the test that probably that sounds a little better to me. I don't like, I'd like to see maybe uh, something in between. I, I, everyone would like to see the horse uphill, but I think that, that in the end uh, you will lose more with the lack of suppleness than, than with the uphill balance. Okay. And before we have Louis back, I have another question. This one, can you talk about, oh no, I'm sorry, there's here. Can you talk about the concept of quality at the Grand Prix? How do you judge a good quality that shows behind the vertical? 
And she says, and you know, I'm not against behind the vertical. Sometimes it's really a pure judging question. So maybe you can ask it better than me. I don't like behind the vertical um, because it affects the horse uh, a lot. Um, get, riding the horse over flex at the pole does not supple the back. Lowering from the wither supples the back, stretching the neck supples the back. If a horse is over, over flexed and behind the vertical, it's limited in the shoulders. The forearm no longer, if you watch a horse, in an overflex position, the forearm no longer comes up in front, no longer comes up with the shoulder. It's, it limits the horse considerably. It does not, it, it, some people think that it's good in schooling. I don't think it's good in schooling, but it's just not appropriate in, in a show at any time. It's really, a, it's, it's a very important basic. Uh, I think you can't go too wrong with on the bit, that would be my goal. Um, but I think that you will, if you really watch horses carefully, you'll see that in overflex position, horse cannot really use itself well. I have a comp, I just, a, it's something I thought of about these short corrections that are done well. I, I was judging a World Cup final. I think it was in Lyon, France, I'm not sure. But uh, Tina Wilhelmsen was, was riding in the Grand Prix, and she's one, just a top, top rider and, and really just a lovely uh, horsewoman with, who has wonderful ba basics. Something in the corner at um, K was scaring a couple of the horses. It scared Isabel's horse. And then Tina's horse made the transition from passage to canter and went completely airborne. I mean, complete, I was looking from below his stomach, came down in the walk, she took two steps and, and cantered, and it happened so fast that when I asked the other judges what they gave for the transition, two of them didn't see it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's my example of, of a recovery. I mean, and I can tell you why she was able to make that correction because it's the same correction that she makes at home every day of her life. You know, so the horse didn't go into a panic. It didn't think it was going to get punished. It's just like bang, zing, and no, walk, canter, and it was over so fast. And, it, and in my mind, that's, that's why I think these corrections are, are so important at home in training horses because they this does happen to the best riders in the world these 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 blow ups happen mistakes happen and for every mistake that the horse can make in the arena i think you should have a pre-planned correction in your repertoire because i think it will i think it will pay off and i think we have louis back yes so let me. Try to. Get her connected again. She may be at the end. We have so many. Luis, do you hear us? Where is she now? I don't see her. Hold on a second. This happens with technology. <laughs> All the time. Here she is. We had set up at 6.30 to practice and I turned my, on my computer and it was um, updating for five minutes. <laughs> I don't know why I cannot give her the microphone.
Kerry, can you call her to see if she is by phone? Oh no, here she is. No, I found it already. Lois? We can see you now. Can you hear me? Yes, we, you're twisting around. Lois, oh, what's happening to you? I, you I been... My computer just said no more. Sorry. Okay, great, but we have you back. Oh. On the for, phone. A moment, for a moment there, I thought you'd been drinking. You were up, upside down. <laughs> water it's water. Only. It's water. <laughs> I, have some, I have some tea here, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so before we start, we, we have some more questions. <coughs> this one here. At the okay. highest levels, it's quite common to see horses that do not maintain immobility in the hold. I'm always surprised about it, and it often seems not to be a big deal for the judges. What do you think about it, and how should it be scored? Our American judges at the low levels or at our national levels, uh, seem to care. Sometimes, you know, remember, there were some famous riders that didn't halt very much at World Equestrian Games and whatever. And it was excused by some. It does count. For us, it's the criteria. It's part of the criteria that they be still three seconds in the first and final halt and in the halt before the uh, rain back it doesn't have to be three seconds it could be you know a halt and then get going but so we do penalize it because it should be that's part of criteria and that's part of the big basics plus criteria so I, I have a question. Um, since we're talking about corrections, let's say the horse comes in, nice, nice canter, nice transition to halt, but he doesn't stand still. Should the rider wait until he settles or should, if, if he's probably certain that he's not gonna stand still, just proceed? What, what would Some be better you have as a judge? Sometimes you have to cut your loss and just take take the hit and get going. Okay, good. I but have another short. I have another question here. When a major mistake is made, how does the rider recover? Well, it depends on what the major mistake is. Where's Gary? I'm here. Oh. Um, <laughs> it depends on the the major mistake if it's like a single flying change that's not clean or doesn't happen that's major uh, but they should be corrected if the rider has the presence of mind sometimes some of the inexperienced riders don't even notice they're on the wrong lead or the horse didn't change it depends entirely on the on the movement, you know. Um, for example, into the 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 horse and rider you were discussing that was known to not stand for the whole, but that was actually mostly in the freestyle. But uh, I think I think that we judges did punish. It was just some punished with a one and some punished with a three or for with a four or something generally. Uh, it depends on whether they thought that the halt was actually established. The, the important thing is, was it established, then it was a halt. If it never was established, then it's insufficient. Um, and a halt is, uh, the, the transition into a halt allows the horse, the rider to correct the straightness. You know, the, the straightness of the halt can be transitioned, it can be corrected in the transition. The halt is the primary score. 
there are two transitions. So if, you're, if your transition is crooked coming in, you can straighten the horse into the halt and get the big score for the halt. So again, you're right, it depends, as Lois said, it depends on the movement and also we don't know the horses. I mean, I've probably ridden more first level tests than anybody's ever seen. But I know I knew my horses, and you know, one horse you could say, "Oh, come on, you're going to stand here now," and another horse you think, "Better just let him go," because you know you can't. He he won't. He's too excited to Lois. You're making me see. I'm sorry. I had to plug my phone in. <laughs> I don't want another glitch. Okay, before you organize. I'm stop pissing you off. We have another question. In the Grand Prix zigzag, how important is bend versus having good balance and uphill straight changes? Bend is important because they're half passes. Yeah, that's criteria. Well, that, that's the criteria of the movement. These are interconnecting half passes and, and a position is, is very, very important. Of course, the more uphill, the better, but without bend, it can't be any kind of sufficient score. And then there are degrees of uphill, and there are some, for example, if I'm sitting at C, uh, I'm not going to see the uphill balance as well as the judges that are on the side. So uh, the I will be seeing the bend, and they will be seeing the balance. Yeah. And that, that's one of the movements we're often different in our scores, because right. the side judges and to some extent, one of the corner judges is at a disadvantage depending on where it's going. Right. So you have to depend on the C judge. We have, we have different jobs. <clears throat> if we're at C, we see straightness and bend. If we're at B or E, or sometimes the corners, we see more quality. Quality well, and also the, out, the outline of the horse and the... Yeah, it's a fun, a fun difference in jobs, but you're going to often see discrepancies. We try to judge alike, but you can't sometimes because the C judge sees one thing. The side judge sees the crowd through the open mouth on the other side. The judge at C might not see that. Yeah, that's correct. I have some other questions here. What Good. support do you give a horse that crosses behind the off? A lower score. When you can see it. Yeah. And the same in front. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't see it. Depends where you see When it. you don't see it, you don't, you yeah. can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's, it's disheartening at the end of the test if you're at sea when a horse comes down the center line and now for the first time you see the piaf coming towards you and it's swinging like crazy and then you think oh no probably done that in every piaf and I was giving it all these high scores. Yeah. <laughs> Another reason for judge discrepancies. But that's our that's our job. That I, that you know we judge what we can see and and that day that's our job. You can't imagine. There was one fairly famous horse once that would come into the ring and I would be thankful when I was at the short side and horrified when I was at the long side. So there are some horses that look very different from different places. And I, I think it was Hilda Gurney said once, a good horse should look good from any angle. I guess that's right. Yeah, for the most part, for the most part it is. Yeah. I, going back to our question, I have a very good one. In the discussion of the counter counter to a change in Prison George, if the horse changes too soon, should the rider change the lead back as a correction? Yes, yes. but through walk. That is the correction. You, 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 a, a general rule is you never correct flying changes with flying changes. First, because if the horse knows sequence change changes and they make a mistake and make a flying change, and then you ask for another one, you usually get a third one. 
or the or the horse thinks, oh, you like to make flying changes too, and they make a third one. I, I, I don't give up the corrections that I make at home, which would be if the horse made a flying change and I didn't want it, I would walk a couple steps and get the correct lead back again, exactly like I do at home, because the mistake's already made. I mean, you've already lost the points for that movement, but, but you have a better chance of getting the next movement and a better start onto where you're going than if you suddenly start throwing flying changes up. Okay, and then I have another one. How would you correct a horse who stands in the collected walk and lacks through and lacks feelings? That's a long process. This is, <laughs> and um, I have a lot of people that are are trying to improve their horses' walk. Um, I think that riders have to commit to the walk, and and horses walk in nature. I think it's better not to ride too much in the walk, except uh, just to accept, uh, you know, maybe think about painting your house and not think about riding for a moment and just let the horse walk in a more natural walk. Some horses are very complicated in the walk. And if you can just simply try to let them be relaxed and a little supple and accept what walk they have, um, it's, it's, it's better than to mess with it too much um it's a very easy it's a very easy gate to destroy it's a very difficult gate to correct when they're started badly and uh, for the rest of their lives someone's trying but i think the commitment to the walk to walk along in some old fashion and let the horse know that you're not preparing for something that you commit to the walk walk along, uh, not preparing for the canter, not preparing for walk, uh, not preparing for Piaf, but just walking, 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 and then go ahead. But it's more important that the walk have clear rhythm. And so would you say, Gary, that in, if, in a collected walk, which usually is where problems begin. What if they rode a little toward medium walk? We I don't might know. Say, I'm not very hard on that. Uh, uh, I'm not either. Especially at the middle levels, you know, the last thing I want to see is the riders trying to shorten up the walks on a recent George horse. And so lose the rhythm. Still, if it's still a, a an over track, I still would probably give something like a seven and say it could be more collected, but I'm not going to be hard on that. And it's better to have a clear rhythm than to have a whole lot of collection in the walk. You know, I don't That's want to be sure. so short. And the big thing that I see with riders is not enough frame in the extended walk and also not allowing the horse's neck to move. They're always so worried about just keeping that head still. The horse needs its head and neck. It's a balancing for the horse. It needs its head and neck and walk and canter and everything. Well, horses use their neck uh, a lot to balance themselves. Yeah, but that's you know, their balancing and, rod. And, and you're not trying to get a head and neck that's just frozen in time. You know, you want the horse to be able to lengthen its frame in order to lengthen its stride. They can't just lengthen their, their strides with their legs. You know, it really has to do with the back stretching and the whole outline uh, covering ground. Yeah. Okay, let me see if we have some more questions. Somebody was asking, uh, do you agree that some cross training is advantageous to horse training? I say that again. Do cross you agree that some cross training is advantageous to horse training? Oh yes, I, I think so. Sure. I wish we all had more time to do it. I wish the riders would uh, here again. Paul Hester had has his riders take the horses out around for fifteen minutes around the property and play before they come in the arena to work. Yeah. It's it's uh, yeah. really a good thing that most people don't spend enough time. And jumping and cavalettis are good for the back and the shoulders. 
and confidence. Yeah. It, it produces athletic ability, you know, or athletic um, training. We, when I first started, the first stable where I rode in dressage, every Monday, everyone free jumped their horses. I thought it was great. I still think it's great. I don't know very many people that do that anymore. I agree. Yeah. Gary, but then going back to the issue of corrections, I think, would you agree that the most important thing is that whenever you need to make a correction, either on training or competing throughout the competition, we don't want to see, you know, bad reactions from the riders, pulling, kicking, making the horse a threat, because that, that makes it worse. As you mentioned at the beginning, could that be a, an important thought to, you know, to give to everybody listening? I, I think it's extremely important, you know, obviously for the results you get in the show ring, but just for good basic training, corrections should make the horse correct um, and not add tension and not, not be a punishment. I, I think it's so important in the training of a horse that, uh, that you, if you, that the horse will learn corrections with relaxation and they will learn if they make a mistake and they're punished every day, then they will do the same thing in the arena. They'll make the same mistake and then they punish themselves. You know, they'll get all excited because they think, oh my God, oh my God, I made a mistake. It's pretty clear to us if a horse, if a, if a, if a rider is tough with a horse in the arena, we have nightmares about what goes on at home. Yep. Well, I mean, really, if, you, if the horse just stumbled and now you're like crashing it with the whip or something, and we see everything, you know, we see all kinds of things. Then you really start to not feel good about the rider, not have confidence in the rider. Uh, it's not good for the horse's training. It's all not, also not good for the rider's image. You know, I get so angry. If you want to be in this sport for a long time, I think you want to have a good image. And, and if you teach people, you want, um, if you teach other people, you want to make a good example. Uh, if you want students to come to you, I think that you, you need to be a good example and, and frame properly and have a good reputation. And I, I think what, what Lois just said, she said openly, it makes me angry. And I have to say that I believe that happens to a lot of the judges. Uh, and we should, should be aware of, of that. And that's not the way of treating a horse. When, I, when I'm judging, if you ever hear me really clear my throat, you know, the, <clears throat> it means <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> Somehow, sometimes, if it's really bad, and I, I probably should get written up, uh, I just say, cut it out. And they stop. I, I've, I've been less tactful, I suppose, a few times. But Whoa, I, I have, as a horse came by, said, if you do that one more time, I'm going to throw you out. But it's it can't you can't help but be angry. But when you when you think that this is not an intelligent animal compared to what a human's supposed to be, and if the if the horse can't figure out what the rider wants, if I can't figure out what the rider wants, how is the horse supposed to know? Just a thought I just had about uh, eau de Concours rides. Oh, there's, there's a real misconception that that you can go into an eau de Concours ride for no points and school you can't it is it is scored exactly there's no there's no training going on in the arena and you can after uh, you can be eliminated and there are errors and you can go out for errors there is no difference between uh, out of being out of competition and in competition and we have we've seen some riders be very tough thinking that they can get away with it in those places and they cannot when i hear a ride is HC, I think, oh no, what are they gonna be up to? Yeah. And I'm yeah. usually yeah. right. Yeah, it's not it's not understood what those rides are for. Someone might have a horse at a first show that they don't want to score for or something. That's that's maybe what that's for. 
but it's not a it's not a it's not okay to be training your horse or punishing it in the arena you still can be thrown out i would have you gone so far as to eliminate anybody for for yes yes that's, that's i had a rider swear at me I had a horse, an amateur training level older lady who stopped her horse and hit it over the head with her hand. Wow. So I stood up and screamed. I, I, did, I don't think it was English. I just stood up and screamed at her and she left. And then she, of course, complained to the TD about it. But I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, understandable. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. Any final comments from you guys? I have one. The judges and you as trainers and riders, but as judges, our job is to, for the welfare of the horse, to protect the horse. That's what our job is. That's why we're evaluating your training and your riding. We, we're rooting for you. We're rooting for all of you. And little mistakes corrected or even not corrected, that's minor to major training flaws. That's my thought. Okay, I totally agree. And the whole idea was this of this was just that um, we appreciate good riding in the arena. Uh, we know horses make mistakes. Uh, we've we've seen some winners with mistakes in their rides that, that were able to handle it because they have some kind of a working arrangement with their horses that um, make corrections at home that are quiet and relaxed. And, and if a horse makes a mistake, they can recover it. So I think that's what we're looking for. We, we would like to think the horses are ridden nicely at home and we appreciate when they're ridden well in the show arena. And it's easier to do things the right way than the wrong way. So I would like to see people really follow the training scale, appreciate your horses, understand they don't know very much about the rule book and what the movements are supposed to be. So we have to be clear with our aids. We have, it's um, a, a lifelong uh, endeavor to try to develop your aids in such a way that you can they are invisible and clear to horses and you can get on any horse and make it uh, better. So our goal is to give high scores in the arena and to promote good riding with good corrections at home. Yeah, we want to give high scores if we could. That's but you sure. have to deserve them. Well, thank you very much. I think this was a very wonderful conversation. I'm receiving a lot of positive wonderful comments from all over around everybody's thanking you a lot and everybody scores for them very enlightening and encouraging and well really thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us i i, I started doing this once the pandemic started and <laughs> it's been so much fun and i've learned so much with all the people that i have invited and i'm really thrilled that you accepted to be here and uh, I hope we can do once again, and I hope I can see you soon, judging so We much. hope so, and thank you so much for organizing it, Cesar. Bye, Bye Cesar. Problems, but it always happens, you know. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks a lot, everybody, for attending. So now I'm activating. Now I'm activating everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, do you like the apartment? What apartment are you talking about? I have unmuted everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm trying to leave. Bill, thanks for joining us. Karen Atala from Honduras, thanks for joining us. Karen. 
Jody, thank you very much. Gracias por estar aquí por todo. Chao. Chao, bye. Shannon, I didn't see you. Thanks for joining. How, how do I turn it off? I'll just leave the room. Okay. Thank you very much, Marcela. Thanks for joining. Do it. Juan Carlos Uribe, gracias por acompañarnos. Gracias a ti, César. Ha sido muy edificante todas estas charlas. Un abrazo grande. Gracias, lo mismo. María Jimena, chao y gracias. Gracias a ti y a, y a todos, César, muy chévere. No, I'm going to leave. I left. Bye, I left. Thank oh. you for joining. I just closed my. Oh my God, he's still there. You're on, but I'm I don't see on. you. Don't worry. Oh my God. Hey, you. Don't Cesar. How are you? Are we are we still on? You are still we on? still on? Yes. Ah, oh, hi. How's everything? Shannon, how are you? How's Wellington? Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to say bye. Talk to you next week. We'll see. I don't have details as to the next one yet, but I will inform you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.